Okay, it's now time. Let me start by welcoming all of you to this online training on Building with Nature Asia to Accelerate Adaptation. And this training is organized by Wetlands International and EcoShape. Let me first thank all of you for registering to this online training and thank you for signing in early. I will be your moderator. My name is Kesrul Abdullah. Uh, let me first give you an overview of the Building with Asia, with Nature Asia Initiative. Uh, next slide, yes. Uh, first, uh, the objective of the initiative is to integrate nature-based solutions into water-related infrastructure so that we can build climate resilient landscapes and this will benefit both people and nature. Overall, we are looking at developing 15 climate landscapes in five countries in Asia by 2030, thereby inspiring further spin-off and upscaling. The initial five countries are China, India, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Of course, we hope that over time, more Asian countries would sign up to the initiative. A quick look at the Building with Nature Asia model. We are preparing landscape propositions and platforms to be presented at the Climate Adaptation Summit, which is scheduled in Rotterdam, the Netherlands on 25th of January next year. This slide gives an indication of our roadmap with a timeline to 2030. Uh, before we start, some ground rules that we would like all of us to observe. First, please mute your microphone. Uh, secondly, we hope we will be able to stay within the time given. Um, use the chat function for your questions and please switch off your webcam so that we don't tie up the bandwidth. Our program for today would be, we would have three parts of 20 minutes each. And at the end of each part, there will be a Q&A session of eight minutes. So without further ado, I would like to invite Foko van der Hoort from EcoShape to start his presentation. Over to you, Foko. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction and welcome words, uh, Kais Rul. Um, and thank you all for all the participants that have joined this, uh, this online training. Um, this is also for us new uh, to do this in an, uh, in an online uh, setting. Uh, so um, we hope this will, uh, uh, this will work. Um, so first, a short introduction of, uh, uh, of myself. My name is Fokker van der Goot. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer um by training um, and i've uh, 14 years of experience in water infrastructure project realization um i worked for uh, uh for a marine contractor for a long time uh, and i've spent many times um, abroad working on mainly traditional infrastructural developments port developments water safety flood defense systems uh, but since two or three years i'm involved in the ecoshape program uh, as a program manager building with nature um, and in that role, I'm um, also responsible together with Wetlands uh, International um, for the Building with Nature Indonesia project. So let's start with the first part of this, uh, this training, uh, which is about the, uh, the general description of Building with Nature and its approach. Um, and I'll, I will also show a few examples, some inspirational projects we have been involved in. Um, the building with nature approach uh, results from the global challenges we are facing at the moment. Um, many countries in the world, also in Asia, uh, but also in Europe, uh, are facing challenges uh, that we have not faced before. Um, the cities are growing, especially in the delta, uh, delta areas and low-lying lands. Um, we have uh, more extreme weather events. We have uh, more water to do. To we have, we have uh, large periods of, of um, uh, uh, dry periods. We have um, climate change, um, pressure on foods, but also energy transition, uh, the need for goods and larger ports. 
all these challenges um, uh, are at a global scale and need to be dealt with at a global scale. And this also results in um, certain actions that are being formulated at the moment, for example, by United Nations, um, about uh, adapting uh, to climate change, uh, and also the sustainable development goals that are uh, focusing on subjects like biodiversity, clean water and sanitation, um, uh, life below water and life on land. And all these aspects relate to, um, uh, to a more sustainable world. Um, but in order to change, in order to deal with these challenges, um, we know that a lot of infrastructure development is needed. And we also know that if you do that in the, in the old traditional way, the single purpose way, um, we will not be able to tackle these challenges. So there's a need for transition. Uh, and that's the essence of the Building with Nature approach, is that the water infrastructure development works with nature rather than against it. And this requires a way, a different way of thinking, a paradigm shift in all the aspects of a project development. The relationship between water and infrastructure development and the environment is shifted to minimizing negative impacts so of building in nature via a neutrality of comp by compensation to optimizing on a positive balance. So that's building with nature, taking nature into account in your design of your infrastructure. In other words, the change from doing not too bad, from doing not wrong, to doing good. And this leads to the, uh, to the, the definition of the building with nature objective, which you can see on the right hand side. Um, building with nature is making the surfaces that nature provides an integral part of the de design of a water-based infrastructure and thereby creating the benefits for nature and society. And this movement started about uh, 12, 13 years ago in the Netherlands, where um, various actors in the Dutch water sector realized that if you want to change, if you want to do things differently, um, you need to understand how that works. You need to collect knowledge. Um, you need to talk to other people from other sectors um, and work together on um, trying to understand each other and trying to realize new innovations and new concepts. Um, the building, building with Nature approach is combining the engineering, the traditional engineering approach with thorough understanding of the ecological system, the physical system, and the governance and societal system, and try to integrate these from the very beginning of a project development into a more sustainable infrastructure. And all these parties realize that you, can do that, you, you cannot do that alone. You need to do that together with the public sector, together with the private sector, together with the knowledge institutes, and together with societal organizations and NGOs. So these actors start, started to um, work together under the umbrella of EcoShape. And EcoShape is a foundation and it has resulted in um, a collective knowledge and public knowledge sharing on the subject of building with nature. And the primary aim of this concept, of this approach, was to implement the building with nature in practice, test the concepts in pilot projects so you understand how these concepts work in the field, study these projects and study these concepts, how they behave in a natural environment, and translate this knowledge into practical guidelines and design rules so others can use this uh, elsewhere in the world. Also an important factor is the development of a collaborative network. So know where you can find the right people that can help you realizing these complex and innovative solutions. And in the end, the primary aim is to use all this information to upskill and mainstream the concept of building with nature. There are a few uh, inspiring examples I would like to show that, are, uh, that have been realized um, under the umbrella of EcoShape or uh, with other parties together with EcoShape. Um, the Building with Nature Indonesia project, uh, of course, um, probably known to most of you, where, we've, where we are trying to realize a mangrove-based economy where we work together with the communities um, to realize sustainable aquaculture in combination with a healthy mangrove system. Um, 
we do this in a very degraded environmental system uh, in Tamak on the north on the north coast of Java, um, where subsidence is 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 severe uh, and erosion is also severe. So it's a very challenging environment. Um, but we see through our physical measures and our social measures that there's that there's an um, uh, a, a change a shift in thinking, especially by the communities where they see if you if you try to understand the system. Uh, and integrate uh, the functions of nature into your uh, daily livelihoods, uh, it can be improved. The set motor, which is an example in the Netherlands, a nature-based flood defense through mega nourishments. The Dutch coast is uh, um, in principle um, eroding, so it's an eroding sandy coast we are having in the Netherlands. Uh, and these eroding coasts need to be nourished um, every two, three years or so. And these nourishment activities are very uh, impactful. So every time a new load of sediment of sand is being brought uh, along the coast, the ecosystem um, is negatively impacted. So instead of doing this every two or three years, a mega nourishment like a, like a set motor is using the forces of nature by placing an enormous amount of sand, uh, sand uh, an amount sufficient for the coming 30 years and let nature, let the waves, let the current, let the tides transport the sediments over time along the coast as a natural nourishment. Um, and besides this, using the physical, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the physical um, effects of nature, uh, it also provides um, room for recreation. Um, it provides room for um, local economy to thrive uh, for tourism, um, and also, uh, like I said, it helps, um, it contributes to the biodiversity. So, a uh, win-win situation. Um, the Marco Wadden. The Marco Wadden is an, um, uh, a nature island construction. Um, it is placed in a, in a very degraded lake system in the Netherlands. Um, over time, this lake has, been, um, be has become very turbid. Um, and as a result of this turbidity, there is a very uh, low amount of biodiversity. Um, so there's very little life in this lake. So by, um, by constructing islands of the fine sediments that are available in the lake, we have created marshes uh, and sandy and, and, uh, um, and soft shores that help to increase the water quality in the, in the, in the lake. Um, and also uh, provide a great place for um, nature lovers, but also for, for birds, for fish to thrive. Um, and it's only been realized uh, two or three years ago, and that there are already a number of species that are not found elsewhere in the Netherlands, but only found here in the, in the Marco Wadden. So it's a, it's a great kickstart for restoring the ecosystem. The Houtrupdijk is another example of a flood defense system that has been upgraded by the Building with Nature approach. The road you see on the, on the right hand side used to be a traditional dike with rocks and asphalt on it. And it was not safe anymore and had to be reinforced. But instead of using uh, more rock and more asphalt, this, um, this, uh, this dike was reinforced with sand and with vegetation, um, creating a, a natural environment with a road in it. So it has been transversed the other way around. Um, and this is a, uh, a building with nature solution in the port environment, uh, the Maconi uh, development, salt marsh development. Um, the port of Delft Cell had to be, um, uh, the breakwater in front of the port had to be reinforced. And this, um, uh, uh, this reinforcement could have been done with adding more, more rocks, adding more asphalt, to the breakwater, but instead we constructed a salt marsh in front of the port by beneficially reuse of uh, fine sediments that are available also in the port. Um, and we have realized a, uh, a beautiful wetlands, a beautiful salt marsh is also available to the public where um, uh, people can enjoy nature um, and it provides safety for the port. So again, a win-win solution. So all of these specific um, 
local context-based solutions um, can be um, translated into concepts. So these concepts like mega nourishment, uh, mangrove restoration, um, salt marshes for ports, all these concepts can be applied elsewhere, but have to be based on the local context, on the local settings, um, and, cannot, and can therefore not be copy-paste. So um, uh, it is the intention of EcoShape and of the, the Building with Nature Asia Consortium to help other countries to translate these specific projects, these specific concepts to other locations by working together with the local stakeholders um, and by um, understanding the physical and natural environment um, and looking at the, the needs um, at these locations and try to find ben benefits for all parties involved um, in these infrastructural developments. So in the next block, I will go into detail about the specific design elements that are uh, related to building with nature. Uh, but first, I would like to open the floor for some questions uh, before we move to the next part. Thank you, Poco, uh, for the introduction to the Building with Nature approach. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Dr. Pineda of the Philippines. And uh, I'd like to invite him to, to ask his question. He has a question on eroding coastline. Uh, over to you, uh, Pineda. You can unmute your microphone and you can pose your question. Hi, hello. Good, good afternoon. Hello. Hi, Foko. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, my question is that uh, in the Philippines, we are experiencing a lot of eroding coastline due to different uh, factors. And my question is that what will be the primary consideration in setting up a semi-permeable structure to trap this sediment and eventually restore the coastline? Thanks a lot for your uh, question. Um, can you um, uh, can you repeat the the cause of this erosion? I, I didn't didn't get that one in your in your question. Uh, there are several factors due to wave action, and then some uh, due to man-made uh, activities. Yeah. So we have we have various of uh, factor to consider then some of which uh, which I mentioned a while ago so yeah. what do you think will be the primary consideration well the the, the first uh, um, comment I would like to make is that um, and that's that's one of the key aspects of building with nature is that um, we and that's that's very uh, very human like we tend to go uh, to the solution straight away so uh, assuming that permeable structures is the solution um, is um, uh, is is for is um, is something that needs to be found out, and um, um, it is very important. Um, I don't have the answer, but I know the approach uh, should be is to um, try to understand the wider system, try to look at the. Uh, the wider scope of the of and the and the root causes of the um, the issues that are at hand, um, and involve the stakeholders present in the in the in the landscape uh, that um, that are um, depending on this um, on this situation, um, and with these three elements, and we we saw, we will also show that later um, together. Uh, in the process of uh, uh, reiteration, uh, you will you can come to a very specific site-based, local context-based uh, solution. And it's um, a building with nature solution is never one solution, but it's always a combination of elements, making use of nature, making use of traditional engineering aspects that will result in the best uh, uh, the best solution for that specific uh, issue. Um, so uh, that's my answer. Perhaps not the answer you were looking for, 
but uh, I think for building good nature, it's very important that you go through the process of um, uh, of understanding um, the root causes, the, the the system, and the um, uh, the desires and the wishes from the local stakeholders um, before moving to designing a solution. But a lot of this will be discussed in the remaining uh, in the other blocks of the, this presentation. Thank you, Foko, for, for the quick explanation. Uh, we do have another question from uh, Dr. Rini Widayayanti. Uh, Ms. Widayayanti, would you want to pose your question to Foko? You need to unmute your mic. Your mic is still muted. I think we have some uh, problem from the mic of uh, Miss Rini. Uh, her question is: How can we adjust the building with nature approach to benefit the interests of local stakeholders? Um, well. A key element is that the local stakeholders are part of the process. So um, from the very beginning, um, and we, I will also show that later, traditionally in traditional engineering approach is very linear, where, for example, a government or a, a private um, developer starts developing uh, a infrastructure uh, with a solution um, um, a predetermined solution, for example, a dike or a uh, other flood defense system. Um, and doing after the design and after the environment impact assessment and after uh, the permitting process, uh, local stakeholders are involved to see how uh, um, their desires can still be integrated. But but that is that is too late. In the building with nature approach, you start with all parties. Um, all the relevant parties, also the local stakeholders, together through the and you, and you do the design together. Uh, of course, the many local stakeholders are not able to design a a, a dike, but they are they have uh, desires and also um, their benefits can be included in in these designs. And if you do that from the very beginning, um, you get you get win-win um, um, solutions. So as a as a, a project developer, um, it is key not to think for for the, the stakeholders, but to think together with the stakeholders. Thank you. So the the, the stakeholder involved in the beginning of the designs. Yes. Hmm. Even before the design. So in the in the initiation phase, uh, when there's nothing on paper yet. Um, try to uh, uh, set up a workshop together with the stakeholders to discuss uh, uh, the desires and the needs of these uh, different actors. Um, and these are not always the same and some, sometimes they will conflict, but uh, you, you, you have to look for the common denominator, the common interest, the common ambition uh, and build on that. And we will see later in the presentation how, how you can do that. Okay, thank you. Right, Foko, we have another question and uh, this comes from Dr. Hasmayana. And she asked, do we have, uh, you know, you showed some uh, case studies, the San Moto, Makawadon and so on. Do we have uh, before and after pictures of the projects? Or do we have any demarcation on which structure and how they are designed in conjunction with nature. Yeah. So these these are um, these are full scale um, um, projects that that um, that were also commercially built. So these are projects that have been tendered, that have been environmental impact assessment have been done, uh, designs have been done, but also. Uh, Alternatives have been uh, um, have been uh, considered, 
So for example, for the sand motor, there's an extensive amount of information available on all the different alternatives that could have been applied, uh, including the, the technical aspects, but also the financial aspects, the costs over time, additional benefits. All this information is, uh, uh, is available and it's also publicly available. So um, um, this, this information is available um, on the Building with Nature Design Guidelines, which are um, uh, which we can uh, uh, distribute uh, after the after the meeting, I think. But there's a lot of information publicly available to support uh, to support these solutions, uh, and also there are there are many pictures available of yeah showing before and after and see how the um, uh, the Building with Nature solution has progressed over time. Because that's very nice about the building with nature solutions, is that they um, they, they grow over time because it's it's a nature based solution, uh, and nature is dynamic as we will see later. Uh, so this um, a dike aesthetic uh, or a, a seawall aesthetic, but a nature based solutions keeps on growing uh, after it has been realized. So you can see that nice in uh, over time. Okay, Voko, we have time for just one last question. Yeah. Uh, and this, this is a tricky one. It asks, uh, it's from Dr. Tati Rose, and it asks, have you ever encountered a situation where the local stakeholders really prefer hard engineering options because this can pro protect them immediately yeah. instead of a building with nature uh, option, which takes time? Uh, and how did you overcome this kind of a situation? This is a very good question, um, and indeed, we that uh, we have encountered that. Um, it's not only because they want to be safe straight away, uh, and I know uh, nature-based solutions, like I said, grow over time, so it takes a bit longer before um, uh, the effects uh, uh, are being um, uh, noticed. Um, but an another element is that people don't like change in general so uh, um, they are used to uh, dikes they are used to traditional solutions and in the netherlands our entire country is based on traditional engineering solutions we have dikes everywhere um, so and people have grown up with this 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 landscape and this this cultural landscape and um, they the initial reaction is that they would like to keep that uh, and often, uh, when you um, when you come up with a nature-based solution, they think, "I don't know. I just want to have a, a dike because that's what I've used to, and I know that it works." Um, so there's a lot of it, it requires a lot of talking and a lot of um, working together and and informing each other and um, collect collecting knowledge together. Um, before uh, before these solutions are accepted, uh, and in and any every single case I've showed, uh, people were were hesitant before the realization, but people uh, loved the solution after it has been realized, and they accepted the, uh, the the additional benefits and the additional values that are provided by these solutions. So often initially people are hesitant. But um, um, when they see it, and that is a very uh, important element of our approach, is that uh, uh, we like to bring people to the solution to show that it works, and it works very inspirational. So if you take people to a nature-based solution and you see it with your own eyes, uh, uh, every single time people th think, oh, this is, uh, this is great, I, I, I want this. Thank you, Foko. So as you can see, new, new, uh, new designs, new options, it takes time for people to accept them. Yeah. Uh, and we really hope through this Building with Nature Asia initiative, we will have many more success stories so that people can accept that this is an innovative way of working with nature. Uh, with that, I'd like to now move on to part two. So again, over to you, Foko. Yeah. Thank you, Kaisrul. So the second part um, is a bit more theoretical, 
and it focuses on the, the building with nature design process and all the elements that are, uh, are required um, from the very beginning to realization uh, of a building with nature solution. So we, uh, in the previous block, I presented a few examples of full-scale applications. Um, and through these applications, we've learned that building with nature solutions are dynamic, they are always multifunctional, they are innovative, and they are based on the local context. So these solutions are dynamic. The nature-based solutions, they employ natural dynamics. So the ecosystem and the natural processes are part of the solution and making it dynamic and different from traditional solutions. So traditional solutions are static designs and focus on controlling the environment rather than using it. Um, the building with nature is a multifunctional approach. So the building with nature combines functions such as flood protection and nature, recreation, um, water quality and other functions. Um, and they, these different functions are connected to one solution. So as such, multiple stakeholders uh, are involved and required for a successful impl implementation. So, and this is again different from the traditional single purpose solutions, the traditional engineering solutions. These are usually, uh, it's impossible um, for a building with nature solution, it's impossible for one party to employ the entire approach. So you, you need other stakeholders to realize multi, uh, to realize building with nature solutions. Um, building with nature is innovative. So the nature-based solutions are new uh, for dealing with water issues and require new types of knowledge for, for example, about the ecosystem functioning, uh, how waves are reduced by vegetation and the robustness, robustness of solutions under extreme conditions. We have seen that nature-based solutions are realized in projects, but many practitioners and engineers, they lack the knowledge and experience on how to start working on the building with nature solution. So standards and guidance are lacking and still limited. Large-scale implementation requires education of practitioners, as well as sharing experience and lessons learned. Well, that's something we do in this, uh, in this training. Um, the building with nature solutions are always local and context-specific. Standard building with nature approaches do not exist. Not only because knowledge development and experience are developing, but also because nature, because building with nature is inherently connected to the local social system and ecosystem and the physical system. So the traditional approach focuses on problem solving and the building with nature approach focuses on opportunity So a traditional approach uh, of realizing a traditional single purpose um, engineering solutions has a very linear process. So it starts by to plan a project or activity. Uh, subsequently, the effects on the ecosystem are described, um, for example, through an environmental impact assessment. The design is optimized to minimize or to mitigate the negative effects of the, the project. And then the impacts are compensated elsewhere by, for example, building with nature or compensating society, uh, fisheries, etc. cetera. Um, and then the, then the project is executed and that's often done in, under very strict conditions, very strict environmental conditions. Uh, based on preset norms and regulations, um, making it a very static and stringent process um, um, with a very negative annotation. So the, 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 the aim is to avoid impact. So with the building with nature approach, it's wider and greener. So it starts with the, um, again, um, understanding the functions, uh, the system functioning. So identify the, the envisioned, envisioned um, uh, functions from the system that you want to uh, use in your design. Determine how natural processes can be used and stimulated to achieve these goals. 
and determine how the governance processes can be used and stimulate to achieve the project goals. So you need to find ways in your governance system to, um, to use the three points mentioned before. And as you can see on the right side, this is not a linear process, but it's an, an, um, uh, this is a, um, a circular process. So it's, it's, a, it's constant feedback of uh, designing, implementing, monitoring, evaluation, and adapting based on the lessons learned. Um, so monitoring is a key activity in this entire process. So throughout the execution of your project, monitor how the, how the environment um, responds to the execution and if necessary, adapt your monitoring program and or adapt your design based on these monitoring results. And after completion, um, and this is something that is uh, in, the, in the traditional engineering always done, after the project has been completed, monitoring stops. Um, um, so post project monitoring is, uh, is, is hardly done, but in building with nature, this is, is key to, to continue uh, because you need to understand how your nature-based solutions progresses over time um, and also how you can adapt and how you can use this information in your maintenance program. Um, so monitoring after project realization is super important. So what are the steps and phases of a building with nature design? Step one is understand the system. And the system, we mean the physical system. So the waves, tides, the currents, uh, sediment transport, um, but, but also the, uh, the, the ecosystem, the social economic, and also the governance system. So how do permits work? How do uh, uh, governments, uh, ministries work together? How can you make, make use of these uh, processes? So it's acquiring a better understanding of the system in which a project is planned. An in-depth knowledge of these systems uh, are crucial to identify the potential win-win solutions. So the second step is identifying realistic alternatives. So identifying realistic alternatives that provide true win-win solutions, providing services beyond mitigation and compensation. Alternatives that make maximum use of the system's potential while safeguarding or even enhancing the sustainability. Um, and this is often done in the, um, let's say, the environmental impact assessment uh, process uh, where alternatives are being compared. Um, and often these alternatives are compared based on the, the construction phase and also the operational phase. And for a building with nature solution, it's very important that especially this, the benefits of this operational phase are being taken into account in the um, um, in the comparison between the alternatives. So step three is evaluate the quality of alternatives and pre-select an integral solution. Assess the inherent qualities of the alternatives and combine them into an one optimal integral solution. Evaluate the building with nature alternatives and compare them with traditional designs. Step four is elaborate selected alternatives so elaborate selected alternatives considering practical restrictions and a governance context. And step five is prepare the solutions for implementation in the next phase on the road to realization. Handle the practical bottlenecks to get the solution included in the next phase on the road to realization. Inclusion in request for proposal, inclusion in the detailed design, inclusion in the project delivery, inclusion in the construction, and inclusion in the maintenance and the monitoring. Um, and then on the left side, you see this, uh, this bubble, and this is, um, this is a phase that has been, and these steps have to continue through these bubbles um, throughout the entire development, project development process. So you, you do these steps in the initiation phase, in the planning and design phase, in the construction phase, and in the um, post-construction phase. So that's the operational or maintenance phase. Um, 
and you look at the design freedom, the, 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 the freedom of choices, and the, the, um, also the level of detail is, um, uh, the level of detail is becoming more, more details over time, and the design freedom is also uh, reduced over time. So in the beginning, um, it's conceptual, and you start detailing and detailing um, over time um, in order to come to the most suitable solution before construction phase. And building with nature, the earlier you start with, um, uh, with um, considering building with nature solutions, the more positive impact you will have um, at the end of the project realization. And again, you have to go through this process not alone, but together with the relevant stakeholders. So with the communities or with the farmers, with knowledge institutes, with engineering firms, with the contractor building the solutions, uh, and with the relevant government bodies, ministries, uh, national level, regional level, etc. So next, I would like to show a, um, a movie of about, I think it's about seven minutes, um, and this is a movie that's part of the Building with Nature uh, course that is being available online. Uh, it's, prevent, it's presented by Jill Slinger, which is a professor at the TU uh, Delft in the Netherlands. Um, and it really nicely explains the entire design process of Building with Nature um, uh, with all the considerations. So I hope you, can, you will be able to hear this. Um, perhaps, Kai Stroel, if you don't hear it, uh, let me know. You now know that building with nature involves the flexible integration of land in water and of water in land. Using materials, forces and interactions present in nature and taking into account both existing and potential nature values and the biogeomorphology and the geohydrology of the ambient environment, to paraphrase Dr. Ronald Waterman. So, it's an integrated design approach that considers hydraulics, morphology, ecology, the societal context, and diverse goals. Building with nature is hydraulic engineering at the interface between nature and society. But what does this mean for your design practice? You now know that engineering and ecological principles underpin building with nature design. But how does this differ from the conventional engineering design process? The conventional engineering design process translates societal norms or standards deriving from values into functional requirements that need to be met by the infrastructure. Take the issue of coastal safety. This societal value is captured in a Dutch defence, flood defence standard. For a particular location, such as the dunes on the South Holland coast, this is specified further into a functional requirement to withstand a storm surge with an annual exceedance probability of 1 in 10,000. We're very familiar with this process of designing hydraulic infrastructure to meet societal needs. But what about meeting ecosystem requirements? Do we also translate these function into functional requirements? Let's consider the issue of nature conservation. This societal value is expressed, for instance, in the European Union's Habitat Directive. And that's in turn captured in Natura 2000 specified areas in the Wadden Sea, for example. Perhaps you think this solves the issue of building with nature design processes. Just specify both the societal and the ecosystem needs in terms of functional requirements, and then engineers can design appropriate hydraulic infrastructures. But how do you design for conservation and restoration, or provide opportunities for the ecosystem? Well, you already know that the bridge is formed by focusing on the character of the system at the level of the hydraulic and ecological design principles. One level above the functional requirements. 
and providing a means of checking the effects of any trade-offs on the functional integrity of the ecosystem. Building with Nature aims to use natural materials, forces and interactions to balance hydraulic infrastructural interventions and the needs and the health of ecosystems as far as that's possible. Just like the conventional engineering design process, the Building with Nature design process has seven steps in an iterative process. These are 1. Define the multi-actor, multi-value problem. 2. Include multidisciplinary knowledge. Apply HE principles and specify preliminary functional requirements. 3. Sketch and describe preliminary designs. 4. Select diverse, promising designs in terms of the HE principles. 5. Test or verify through prototyping or modelling. 6. Incorporate relevant new knowledge, revise the functional requirements, refine or redesign, retest and check in terms of the HE principles. And finally, select the final design for multi-actor evaluation. So how does the Building with Nature design process differ from the conventional engineering design process? Let's move through each of these steps and clarify the differences. Step 1. Define the multi-actor, multi-value problem. This means scoping the problem very widely and taking the diversity of perspectives and values on the issues into account. It represents a fundamentally different starting point in which a single client is not viewed as representing societal ecosystem needs. There's also a deep acknowledgement of different sources of knowledge on the environment, varying from that possessed by local residents to official data sources. And now step two, that's including multidisciplinary knowledge, applying the HE principles and specifying preliminary functional requirements. Here, diverse types of knowledge from ecology to engineering play a role. The environment is described in terms of form and functioning and the character in terms of the HE principles. Preliminary functional requirements are specified. So are the boundary conditions and the loads. But the first two steps in designing in the building with nature design process are very different to those of the conventional approach because of their wide scope and their explicitly open stance to other and diverse knowledge sources. Moving on to steps three and four, the sketching and the subsequent selection of promising designs. These are similar to the conventional method, except that different knowledge is brought to the table, the functioning and character of the ecosystem is included, and the time horizon covers the life cycle of the artifact that is being designed. Five, test or verify the designs, prototyping and modeling. Ecological assessment and prediction are the additional items used in this step. And now moving on to step seven, we select the final design for multi-actor evaluation. This step is also very different from the conventional engineering design process. It means that we don't only check whether the functional requirements are satisfied, we cross-check whether the potential solution adheres to the HE principles. We ask for a sound explanation of its performance against the principles, so as to understand where the trade-offs are being made. Only when these aspects are satisfied are the potential solutions evaluated by stakeholders holding very different perspectives. If all of these aspects are not satisfied, we move to the iterative step, step six, where we incorporate new knowledge, revise the functional requirements, refine or redesign, retest, and check in terms of the HE principles. This represents the iterations needed to improve a design. The differences relate to the possibilities of including new knowledge sources when the design process is already ongoing, and revising the functional requirements both of which are not routinely included in an engineering design process, a conventional engineering design process. So the building with nature design process can be depicted like this. 
And the major differences in the two design processes are first, that in building with nature, we adopt a stance that acknowledges complexity. We anticipate the need to include many actors or stakeholders with different perspectives, as well as multiple knowledge sources. So we are accepting of uncertainty, recognizing that natural systems are dynamic and that ecosystems can have unexpected responses. Yet, we think about the long term, about natural dynamics and the life cycle of the artifact. Finally, in building with nature, we integrate ecology and engineering using the HE principles. After all, building with nature is a balancing act involving trade-offs in multidisciplinary design space. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we can now move on to the Q&A for this session. And we do have a very interesting question from uh, Dr. Rini. Uh, she asks, um, we know that nature is very unpredictable. And so working with nature can be very challenging and also full of uncertainties. So how can we accommodate these uncertainties in our design and in our implementation? Do we have the knowledge or is it basically a trial and error process? Again, a very good question. Thanks. Um, I wouldn't say a trial and error. Uh, I would say adaptive management. Um, so it's a, it's a learning by doing approach. Uh, we realize that these, many of these concepts have been um, implemented only once or twice in a very specific condition, a very specific setting, uh, and it, but it works in this particular setting. So in order to replicate this to an, another environment or another setting, for example, in India or in the Philippines or, or, or Malaysia, um, you need to go through the same process as, as they have gone through. So um, that is the process that was just explained in the previous, uh, in, the, in, the, in the movie clip by Jill Slinger. Um, Understanding the functions of nature at your project site, understanding the, um, the desires and the requirements of the local communities and the other stakeholders and actors. Um, and it could be that you need to have intermediate steps to gain confidence in, in a particular nature-based solutions. And you can get confidence, for example, um, through uh, the use of, of tools, the use of a, a pilot, for example, to test a particular concept first in a pilot setting, uh, which is a smaller scale setting um, where you research or where you investigate how the concept behaves. And when you gain confidence, when you, uh, when you are confident enough, you upskill. We have done this in Indonesia, uh, for example, um, where we have uh, done the test, uh, the permanent structures in the MAC. Uh, in a in a pilot setting, in a demonstration project setting, together with the Ministry uh, of Marine Affairs and Fisheries and Public Works, um, and after some time, after monitoring and after um, uh, analyzing, we gain confidence, and the and the uh, uh, and the Ministry gain confidence, and they replicated the concept in other locations. So that's a process you have to go through. Um, so, but there will be a, f uh, a few more slides on this topic in the next block also. So, but this is a very important uh, 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 aspect, gaining certainty in your building nature design. Okay, uh, we, we do have a question uh, regarding case studies, but I think uh, Susanna has put it into the chat, uh, a link. Uh, there's another question which looks at the comparison on the building with nature concept compared to the traditional way. Uh, in terms of cost and time of construction, is there a lot of difference? Uh, or is there, uh, or is one of the method superior to the other in terms of the cost as well as time of construction? Um. 
for a building with nature solution to succeed, it has to be cost effective. So it has to be comparable in terms of costs to the tradition to a traditional solution. But the question is, what are the costs and what are the benefits? Um, if you only look at uh, at the costs of a construction, then a traditional solution could be cheaper. Uh, not always, but it could be. Um, However, if you also include the benefits of the solution, um, for example, the benefits for um, local livelihood of the of, of the, the communities, or increase in tourism, or um, uh, well, there are other other uh, increase in, for example, house prices uh, because the the area has become more attractive. Um, if you also include these values. These, uh, these benefits into your cost-benefit analysis, then um, uh, I would say often, and in most cases, building with nature solutions will come out more cost-effective than traditional solutions. And also in terms of construction, um, many of the projects I've shown in the, in the first block, for example, the sand motor, um, it's a nature-based solutions, but it was constructed in, uh, in four months time um, and after four months, it has its effect. Um, so uh, there are definitely concepts that are that can be constructed in a, in a timely manner and in a comparable manner as a traditional solutions. Can I con shall I continue or are there more questions? Uh, yeah, there, there is one more, um, and it's uh, it's from Ifid, and she asks uh, when, when we look at uh, building with nature, you've come up, you, you said we need to do a systematic analysis of the environment. Uh, so how, how do we go through this process, developing a design of a solution together with the local stakeholders? Uh, I'll suggest I, I'll first present my first, uh, my, my, my next uh, block, because some of these aspects will be discussed. Okay. And if, if, I, if I have not answered the question right, then please ask it again in the next block. Yeah, okay. Yeah? Uh, I think that that's a good suggestion that uh, we would let FOCO continue with part three. Uh, and then at the end of it, we still have some time for questions from the earlier parts. Yes. Right, so over to you, uh, FOCO, on part three. Yeah, thanks. So in this part three, we, we will look at the... Um, the barriers and the enablers of building with nature implementation. And this relates very much to all the questions you've been uh, asking us so far. Um, so I've shown this uh, slide before. Um, we have seen that building with nature solutions are dynamic, they are multifunctional, they're innovative, and they're always context specific. And on a policy and local level, uh, sorry, on a policy and political level of um, uh, the building with nature approach, is believed uh, and promoted to be the way forward for a sustainable planet. So at this level, um, nature-based solutions and building with nature is an, ex is an uh, accepted approach uh, and people believe this is the way forward. However, we see that implementation and upscaling is still challenging. This is because of its characteristics, it's dynamic, multifunctional, innovative, new, inclusive, context-based, um, and these are all hampering a larger uptake. Um, these are make it more complex. The process to implement building with nature concept differs fundamentally from that uh, of more traditional single purpose hydraulic engineering solutions. Um, but through the lessons learned of the 12 year experience we have by learning by doing and intersectoral collaboration and fundamental research and pilot projects, in the Building with Nature program, we have identified a set of barriers and a set of enablers that are involved in the uptake and the mainstream of Building with Nature. So these enablers um, uh, can help others to overcome the barriers they are facing in realizing Building with Nature solutions. And these barriers and enablers for Building with Nature implementation, they are involved uh, with the following uh, uh, aspects. Um, they focus on multi-stakeholder approach, on the, on the building with nature technology, 
adaptive monitoring, management and maintenance, the institutional embedding of the concept, the business case and the financing of building with nature solutions and capacity building. So I will, I will in the next uh, part, I will go through all of these uh, aspects uh, and we'll provide a few examples from our program, uh, what we have learned about this, uh, this aspect. So let's start with the multi-stakeholder approach. And um, the Building with Nature program started off as a, as, a, as, a, as a technical program where we tried to understand the engineering, uh, the relation between engineering and ecology. Um, however, in the past years, at, at least I have realized that the multi-stakeholder approach is, I think, the most important aspect of the approach, um, of the building of nature approach, because all other steps, um, they, they require a multi-stakeholder approach. So understanding of the system, uh, the technology, the, uh, the business case, that's, all that is need, uh, to do that, you need a multi-stakeholder approach. So building with nature is a multifunctional concept we have seen, which means that different and more stakeholders are, are involved in comparison to uh, traditional solutions. And each nature-based solution is closely connected to the local context of the applications. So it also involves the people that are live in the, at the location where the solution is realized. The involvement of local stakeholders is critical for the success of the implementation. Uh, enabling building with nature requires thus a multi-stakeholder approach. So I want to explain that um, through, the, through an example, uh, a case uh, of multifunctional marshes. Um, so you see here a picture of a landscape uh, from the north of the Netherlands. Um, on the right hand side is the, is the sea and op, on the left side is agricultural lands. And between the agricultural lands and the sea, there's an extensive area um, uh, which, which consists of a, um, let me see if I can, a laser point, uh, consists of a, a flood defense system, a traditional dike uh, with asphalt, a, um, an area, a salt marsh area, which is divided in two, um, two areas. On the, on the inner side, this area is protected by a, uh, a lower dike um, that is only uh, flooded during extreme events. Um, and there's an, uh, a foreshore of marshes. Um, and this land has been created very similar to what we have done in Indonesia with permeable structures, um, gaining, uh, reclaiming land from the sea in order to provide aerial for uh, farmers to have their stock, uh, to feed their stock. So this land is owned by a nature conservancy, uh, but farmers are, um, uh, farmers are able to use this land for their, um, for their, uh, for the uh, stock. So this dike has to be reinforced. Um, and the question is what to do with this salt marsh land because it's slowly sinking and uh, uh, into the sea. So there are different options. Let me switch off the laser. There's a traditional single purpose flood defense system that can be applied or a multifunctional flood defense with a salt marshes uh, that can be used for recreation, uh, that can be used for the, by the farmers, um, that provides services for nature um, and provides flood defense. Um, there are several actors involved in this development. Um, there's the government that is responsible for flood risk. There's the local community, the farmers that make use of this um, uh, of this land for their daily livelihood. Uh, and there's a nature NGO uh, that is uh, responsible for the conservation of this because it's a very, it's a highly important site for birds. So traditionally, um, the government actor is responsible for the development of this. And the government has a, in principle, a monofunctional 
um, uh, system in his mind because he is responsible for flood safety and he is not responsible for nature conservancy and he is not responsible for um, providing access um, to uh, for the farmers to use this land. So his primary responsibility is flood um, defense system. So um, this actor would, uh, if he's going to develop this project on his own, he would choose for a mono, uh, a single purpose solution because that benefits him the most. Um, and this function provides less benefits to the uh, nature conservancy um, and also for the, for the tourists and also provides less benefits for, uh, for the farmer. So a multifunctional solution is perhaps less in favor for the government responsible for flood risk because there are other um, services that he needs to include in this solution, uh, which is not contributing directly to the flood safety. However, this multifunctional system is a lot more beneficial for the other actors. So if you look at the... Um, the total benefits of the two solutions, you can see that the um, that the multifunctional solutions compared to the single purpose solutions, that's a lot more benefits for all the actors involved. And in the end, as a government being responsible for uh, the public um, uh, the public well-being. Uh, it could be considered that this is also, in the end, for, for, for the government, uh, a uh, beneficial solution. However, the government, in this case, is only the government responsible for flood risk, not the government responsible for nature conservancy or other, uh, or, or other uh, services. So um, you can see that um, if you develop a project on your own, um, you tend to look only at the benefits that are applicable to you. So the added value of collaboration is that the multi-stakeholders have to collectively determine the outcome of the solution. And secondly, each stakeholder, like I said, values the solution from its own perspective. But if you add up these perspectives, you could, it could be possible that a, a multi-purpose solution is, mo is more beneficial for all the stakeholders um, in comparison to if you develop a project on your own. And the stakeholder are only collaborating in this process if these benefits uh, are being included um, and if they see that collaboration um, is the the only way these benefits are being implemented this is perhaps a bit uh, a little simplistic uh, and I realized that in reality with stakeholders this is this is more complex but this um, this concept has been applied in the case I just explained. Um, um, so the stakeholders did a kind, all kinds of workshops, scoring and providing solutions from their own perspective. And in the end, a solution was chosen, um, and, uh, a, a multi-purpose solution was chosen and implemented, um, uh, providing more benefits to all the stakeholders rather than a single purpose solution. So, the enabler of building with nature technology. The inclusion of ecosystem services in civil and hydraulic engineering features is new and requires new technology regarding the system understanding, the nature-based concepts of different landscapes and the impact assessment. In the building with nature program, nature-based concepts have been developed and applied for Sandy and muddy coastlines for lakes, for rivers, for cities, and for ports. So a lot of relevant landscapes also 
um, uh, present uh, in the, the countries that are participating in this training. So this enabler provides an overview of the concepts in different landscapes and it explains what the concept entails, how it works, where it can be applied, etc. So from the set of pilots we have, um, we have executed, we have derived a set of 28 of building with nature concepts that have been, that are depicted here, um, that can be applied and translated to a new location. Again, based on the stakeholder involvement, based on the understanding of the local system. Um, but this, this provides a set of, uh, of, of tools, of uh, concepts that can be applied um, um, elsewhere. So I would like to show a little movie clip about um, one of the concepts that we have investigated. And these are the vegetated foreshores for flood defense systems. We have to protect ourselves from the water. For centuries we have built high dikes, but unfortunately this is often at the expense of nature. Recently things have been changing. Our understanding of the water system has improved and we can deal with flood risks in other ways. Hence we have developed knowledge of building with nature. We studied the use of vegetated foreshores for flood risk reduction and the certainties that are needed to implement this system, such as more knowledge on the precise functioning of the foreshores and new forms of governance involving nature conservation agencies and water managers. So what if we broaden our scope, if we not only consider the water as our enemy, but embrace the power of tides and waves in our favour? How could that benefit us? In a situation without foreshores, there is a high wave load on the dike during storm surges. What happens in a situation with foreshores? The system with mud flats and salt marshes attenuates the waves. Each natural foreshore is characterized by the same gradients. We study the wave damping effect of sediments and vegetation. The wave loads on the dike are lower. The dike can be less high and strong and the original nature flourishes. For centuries, the sea and rivers have transported small sand and clay particles. These particles are the building blocks of the delta. This natural process is still functioning. However, we still don't fully understand how this works exactly. How does the coastal area develop? What causes sedimentation of the particles? And under what conditions can new foreshores develop? If we understand the delta, we can make better use of its natural processes. The vegetation traps sediment during each tide. With a rising sea level, new sediment can settle on the foreshore and the foreshore height increases. There is no need for a repeated increase in dike height. In this way, nature can keep developing. We allow centuries-old processes to do the work for us. We build a safer delta with room for the value of nature, which we can keep enjoying. So that movie was um, showed an example of how a concept is being studied and how these um, uh, these lessons are being translated into to guidelines, into tools that you can use to engineer and to design uh, salt marshes for flood defense systems. And this also relates to, um, for example, mangrove systems. So let's move on to the um, um, to this to the third. Um, uh, enabler, which is adaptive monitoring and management and maintenance. Um, so this, this relates to one of the questions uh, asked earlier. So to cope with the dynamics and uncertainty, 
management and maintenance should be adaptive. Focus on embracing the nature's dynamic and not controlling the design. A monitoring and management system needs to be in place that can be respond to these dynamics. The solution is dynamic. The management and monitoring system in this place should be dynamic as well. So you need to adapt if uh, the system uh, requires this. Uh, and this approach prevents costly over-designing in the design phase. The nice thing about building with nature solutions is that they are often soft, so uh, they are easy. Uh, they are a lot easier to adapt uh, when this, this is required. Uh, instead of a concrete wall, uh, once the wall has been constructed, it's very difficult to um, uh, to change it a little bit. So design can be adapted to unexpected changes, for example, climate change or subsidence or other, uh, 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 other aspects. Um, and I want to illustrate this in a, for, uh, uh, by an example, um, which, is, which is one of the pilots we've executed, is the Houtrip Dijk. Um, I'm not going into full detail of the, the background of this, um, uh, of this case, um, but I would like to show the, uh, the way an, a pilot has been used to gain confidence in a concept. So on the right hand side you see uh, uh, a dike uh, with a road uh, on it uh, in the middle of two lakes, uh, Lake Isel and Lake Marken. And this dike was considered not safe anymore and had to be reinforced. Um, the, the dike could be um, either raised um, in the traditional way or a building with nature solution could be uh, considered. Um, and the government, uh, the HWBP, the High Water Protection Board, uh, which is a very important body in the, the government of the Netherlands, responsible for flood safety, they were interested in considering building with nature solutions. However, it was not done before in this context, in this local context. So instead of doing it full scale straight away, or instead of choosing for the uh, the easy way, which is a, uh, or the short term easy way, which is a traditional solution, a pilot was uh, executed together with EcoShape. So a sandy foreshore, um, 500 meters was constructed in front of the dike. Uh, and for four years, we extensively monitored the behavior of this, this sandy body um, with vegetation on top of it. Um, all kinds of models will, were validated and developed to see how the, morpho the, the, the morphological processes and the currents and the waves would affect these um, descent body. Uh, and after three, four years, we gained confidence that this solution would be able to provide safety for the entire dike. And a very important element in this, and you can see that on the left uh, side, is that all the stakeholders that are involved in the development of this, uh, that are responsible for this, this safety of the dike, were part of a user group uh, that were taken uh, to the pilots every six months or so to discuss the behavior, to discuss how this solution worked in reality, uh, so they could see it with their own eyes and gain confidence. So, um, and the, this is the director of this uh, of this high water protection board. He was a member of the steering committee uh, and also responsible for the upscaling part. So it's very important to have these actors involved in the in the piloting phase. So and in the end, we gain confidence and the government gained confidence and the, um, um, uh, the concept was upscaled to 10, uh, to 10 kilometers of dike uh, enforced with, uh, reinforced with sand and vegetation. So let's move on to the next enabler, uh, institutional embedding. So institutional or governance structures determine the formal and informal rules of any implementation. So also the traditional ones, but also for building with nature. Uh, and these are reflected in the projects, distribution of the resources and responsibilities among stakeholders um, and in technical guidelines. Some of the rules can be changed easily. For example, the participants in the project team uh, but laws are very difficult to change. Um, traditional solutions are usually designed to facilitate uh, implementation of static hydraulic infrastructure. So changes are needed to enable dynamic 
building with nature approaches. The characteristics of the current institutional structure, and that I think applies to any country in the world. Um, so the characteristics of the current institutional structure may hamper the building with nature implementation. Building with nature guidance are needed to inform particular practitioners how to do implementation, um, but these are scarce. And enabling building with nature requires institutional embedding. And it's important to link your, um, your building with nature solution to international enabling environments for nature-based solutions to which countries have committed. For example, the Paris Agreement, Sendai Framework, Ramsar, UNCCD, SDGs. These are all commitments that many of the countries, I think all of the countries uh, uh, present here uh, have committed to. Um, and these provide links for you to uh, uh, use Building with Nature or implement Building with Nature. So, but there, like I said, there are some uh, fundamental barriers that we see in many countries and that the current institutional system organize environmental issues and infrastructure separately, while cooperation is needed to enable building with nature. In, I think 90% of the countries, we see that there's a ministry of environment and there's a ministry of public works. Um, and these typically also relevant for most countries uh, ministries uh, have often difficulties to um, to communicate and to work together um, uh, um, and it apl applies to many sectors uh, but for building with nature uh, having these two institutional systems uh, organized is super important plus safety projects should be guaranteed safe for a certain lifetime period while nature-based solutions are dynamic that's also a, a, a considered as a barrier and building with nature guidance um, is needed uh, for practitioners to, to implement it. So I want to explain this uh, by an example of uh, the Hondsbos Sea Defense, which is a development in uh, nature-based solution development in the Netherlands. On the left-hand side, you see um, the old situation, which is a traditional sea dike. Uh, with concrete uh, and asphalt, uh, very static and very um, uh, traditional. And this has been transformed to a, uh, a sandy solutions with dunes um, and uh, uh, vegetation, um, providing a more dynamic solution, uh, but also uh, room for recreation and other uh, activities. I'm not going into detail about the specific solution, but I would like to show a few examples how um, uh, institutional um, ways have been found to come to a realization of such a new innovative solution. So in the traditional way, the project realization would be a, a, a linear process, project plan development, procurement, tendering, execution and maintenance. Um, this is a very, and the first part is done typically by the government, the execution by a contractor, and he hands it over to the government again for the maintenance phase. But in a more innovative way, in order to stimulate innovation and stimulate nature-based solutions, um, the tender and plan procedure is done parallel. So from the very beginning, a selections of bidders have been identified. Uh, these are contracts and engineering firms. So it's a commercial, commercial pro, uh, um, a tr a process. Um, and they have set up a dialogue uh, structure with the government and these commercial bidders to develop uh, jointly these project plans um, and the, the contractors could provide uh, input on the design of these nature-based solutions uh, while the government includes these new ideas into the project plan and environmental impact assessment. So there's an interaction between uh, the design uh, and um, uh, the project design uh, plan development uh, and that provide tools for the government to to gain knowledge and to um, to uh, to gain understanding of the possibilities for nature-based solutions another 
uh, very inno innovative institutional uh, process was implemented here, um, which is the, the use of the valuation of nature in the contract award. So typically 99% of the infrastructure developments are being awarded based on price. So the cheapest contractor, the cheapest uh, bidder wins the, uh, the contract. And that does not stimulate to propose alternative innovations for nature-based solutions. Um, there is a way to do this. And that is by, for example, by, um, by including a fictional discount on your total price by valuation of uh, values that you find important. And these values can be anything, but it can also be nature uh, or building with nature solutions. But so, um, for in this case, the total value of the contract was 143 million euros. Um, but the, um, the bidder could score um, fictional uh, euros discount uh, if they would have uh, very good designs on nature, on recreation, on maintenance, on nuisance. Um, and they get a fictional reduction on the price. So it could be that you are the, uh, the bidder with the highest price, let's say, um, uh, there's an example on the, on, the, on, the, on the bottom right. So the party A has a bid price of 143 million euros uh, and party B 140 million. Uh, in the traditional way, party B would win it. But in this case, party A has scored very high on his nature-based solutions. He receives a, a fictional discount of 40 million euros on his price and his, um, his fixtures price is now cheaper and he will win the project and is being able to realize this nature-based solution. So in this way, it provides tools for uh, a government to, um, uh, uh, to create incentives for the market to come up with innovative building with nature solutions. I realize I have to, uh, to speed up a little bit. Uh, could, could you just uh, give your conclusions, uh, Foucault? Yeah. I will, uh, I will skip this one. I want to do this, I'll do this last bit, which is, uh, which is very short, and then uh, we can go to the questions. So um, another example is, another enabler is capacity building. So it's knowledge development for, um, for practitioners to be able to implement uh, uh, and use building with nature. Um, and this, this capacity building should be done at all levels. So local levels, training communities in how nature-based solutions are used and can be used in their daily livelihood. For example, as shown here, through coastal field schools in Indonesia, when the communities are trained to monitor their own uh, sustainable aquaculture measures and being able to use that information uh, uh, to adapt their, their way of working, to training of um, uh, trainers at a regional level to apply building with nature uh, in their uh, in their technical institutes to online trainings at universities um, uh, at national level and beyond uh, where building with nature forms part of the engineering approach um, um, so new uh, graduates are being trained from the very beginning by using uh, the principles of building with nature uh, and with this, I would like to um, to end this uh, third block. Apologies for being uh, a little bit late. Thank you, Foucault. Uh, I realize we are almost at the end of the scheduled time, but I think uh, Susanna has put out, we might be going about five minutes over time. Uh, I, there is a question um, from Irene, and she's asking, how can the building with nature projects work side by side with the traditional or the conventional engineering projects, especially for coastal protection works? Thanks for this question. Um, we don't say that, that any problem can be tackled with a full building with nature solution. There are, um, there are 
situations where um, hybrid solutions are needed. So a combination of a traditional hard infrastructure in combination with a nature-based solutions. Um, or even, especially in the in environments, uh, for example, in the city environment where there's very little space, it could very well be that in, in, in very specific cases, um, a traditional solution is just the, 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 the best way to, to, to tackle a problem. Um, uh, however, we believe that applying the building nature approach should always be done, uh, but the end result is either a combination of traditional and um, uh, building with nature or full-scale building with nature. So they can, they can, they can be combined. I guess we, we might have a project, say uh, we are building defenses against a super typhoon. And yeah. here we are, we are putting a new untested process against a tried and tested thing. So there's a risk involved. How, how do we convince decision makers to opt for building with nature? Um, but I think the, the best argument for opting for building with nature is the additional benefits for all parties involved. So it, it, it has to provide this, the required safety. That is the primary, the primary condition. Um, but choosing an, a traditional solution um, has often negative impact for the environment, has often um, causes often issues elsewhere. For example, disturbance of the sediment balance, removal of, of valuable ecosystems, uh, reduction in water quality, um, all kinds of environmental issues. Whereas the building with nature solution um, not only um, uh, not only provides the required safety, but also adds value to the system. So um, it provides room for nature to thrive. It provides uh, room for society to, society to thrive and it provides the right uh, uh, safety conditions. But I realize for typhoon conditions, uh, hybrid solutions are, are uh, to be considered um, because we know that only vegetation um, uh, uh, will um, is difficult to use for only uh, uh, um, typhoon um, um, safety. Right, so um, we have heard how we can combine both building with nature together with conventional. Yeah. Um, and I think a good example would be uh, in Denmark, in Indonesia. Um, we have uh, run out a little bit over our scheduled time. Uh, and I do apologize for that. But when we were drawing up the curriculum for this training, uh, Foucault has so much experience that uh, we think it would be useful for him to share with all of us. Um, basically, this is an introduction to building with nature. And yes, I know we all have still many questions to ask. Uh, the, whole th the whole training has been recorded and the slides as well as the recording will be made available for all of us to, to have a second look. Um, and for the teams in the, in the five countries, um, it is to help us to identify a pilot project. And then when we have identified a pilot project, um, the, we, we, will, we will bring Hans on board to help us on how to work through a pilot project, how to develop a landscape proposal uh, with, a, with, a con uh, with a country team. So we, we recognize that there's still a lot that we want to know about building with nature, um, but it's going to be a process where all of us will work together <laughs> and hopefully we will share our experience in our countries with each other. So I'd like to bring this to a close and I'd like to say thank you first to Susanna for hosting and organizing uh, this training program. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Foucault uh, for sharing his experience. Um, and I do know uh, we should have given him more time. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you 
for joining us in this training online as well as staying on over time. So I uh, look forward to more interactions with all of, all of you uh, in the future. And as I say, uh, all of this will be put on and it will be available for us to download and to go through it again. So with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much and I'd like to call this online training to a close. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. We, See you. We, we will we'll send you uh, through email uh, the link for you to be able to download all the materials that we have used in this training session. OK, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone.